And first of all, we will begin, as yesterday, with topical questions. These will last up to 15 minutes, and then we will move on and deal with questions that appear on the oral question list. If that is clear, I call Michaela Boyle. Uh, can I ask the Minister what her department is doing to try and increase the drawdown of the EU funds, particularly from the Horizon 2020 programme? Gormila. Um, Horizon 2020 will be a significant funding stream for R&D with an estimated budget in excess of 70 billion and I'm very keen obviously that the agri-food sector um, maximises the drawdown and achieves the full benefit of this and that's in line with the aspirations that have been set out in the going for growth uh, strategy. DART has provided three years funding for a contact point post which will be based at um, AFBI. The purpose of that post is to provide the agri-food sector with relevant information to allow them to maximise the drawdown that the North received from the new Horizon 2020 research budget. And that new appointee will take up their post at the end of this month. In addition, my officials will work closely with officials in their other departments as part of the executive cross-departmental subgroup of the Barroso Task Force, the working group. The IT um, subgroup has produced a communication strategy which clearly sets out the structures in place to help sectors obtain the relevant information to ensure that we maximise the opportunities available under Horizon 2020, and that will be of benefit to the agri-food sector. Uh, can I further ask the Minister, uh, in relation to maximising the drawdown, what targets is the Department setting? My target is to increase um, our drawdown of funding by at least 20 per cent, and I think that um, the fact that we have um, now put in place, or are about to put in place, our AFB contact point, that will play a very significant role in, in enabling us to be able to do that. Um, uh, last year, AFB actually threw down about 1.3 million in R&D funding, and we're working very closely with them to make sure that we increase that. Uh, actually, just last week, last Wednesday and Thursday, I was in Brussels, and um, Tina Anderson MP actually facilitated a number of meetings with both the Commission, the Parliament, obviously um, through herself, and also um, the Council, where we met a range of people to promote the work that AFBI are involved with, um, particularly around research and development, and making sure that AFBI are known in Brussels, that whenever it comes to drawing down the um, Horizon 2020 funding, that we're at the table, that people know who we are, people know what we um, have to offer. And AFBI have done significant work in terms of research and development, particularly working in partnership with other research agencies. So, um, we also had a very key meeting last week with Myra Gagan Quinn, the Commissioner, who will be responsible for rolling out Horizon 2020. So again, that was very fruitful. She gave us very useful information in terms of um, looking towards the new programme and how we bidding into the new programme. So I think that um, that's going to be a major piece of work. And obviously we have executive targets and um, individual DARD targets to make sure that uh, we draw down uh, the most money that we possibly can for research and development funding. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister, with reference to the performance of the local action groups in the distribution of uh, rural development funds, can you detail uh, if you feel the delivery model that has been, uh, uh, if it has been a success, and to outline what performance indicators have been used to identify their performance? Well, I think that um, there's obviously lessons to be learned. We, in a lot of ways, we inherited this programme and the mechanism of. Um, how things have been rolled out. I think the fact that we're now out to consultation, we're going to gather up all the issues uh, on the new rural development programme. We'll be able to gather up all the issues that there are uh, in looking to the new programme, how we can do things better. There'll always be ways to do things better. Simple things about um, no matter if you wanted £1,000 or £100,000 from the rural development programme funding, it's the same application process. So I think there are a lot of um, quick changes, positive changes that we can make in the new uh, programme. We launched the consultation um, during the summer, and that's going to roll out for uh, another wee while. We've actually, there's a consultation event tonight. I'll be going to one on Thursday night. So that's an opportunity to listen at first hand to those people who have been involved in the LAGs and the JSCCs actually delivering the programmes on the ground. To me, that has been successful in that there should be that bottom-up approach to delivering local projects in local areas and meet the needs of those local areas. So I very much want to listen to the views of stakeholders and will shape the new rural development programme based on... Uh, the consultation exercise that we carry out and very much um, I have no doubt that my door will be knocked constantly over the next few while on people who have very strong views about how we deliver the new rural development programme. Sydney Anderson. Well, thank you and I thank the Minister for that response but uh, LAGs do have uh, their role to play but <coughs> Minister would you consider using DARD staff on the services to deliver more rural development schemes under the new common agricultural policy in comparison to that uh, current model 
Uh, and would this not ensure that more money reaches the intended beneficiaries? I think that um, the, the way that uh, we do things with the bottom-up approach, with the leader approach, I think that's a very positive way to do things. It's how I would envisage that we will continue to do it in the future. I think there are lessons to be learned. I don't think that we will um, necessarily need all the structures that we have at this moment in time, but there may be ways that we can improve things, particularly around the current structure of GSCCs and lags. Do we need that in the future? But again, that's all part of the consultation exercise that's ongoing at this moment in time and then I hope to be able to make uh, a position on the way forward and announce the way forward um, later on in the year, certainly in the early part of next year. Sean Rogers. Thank you Mr Speaker. Bearing in mind, Minister, the recent meeting between DART officials and the oyster farmers, what steps are you taking to provide support for them in Carlingford Lock and, and Lock Foyle after the stock was decimated by the recent virus in July? Um, officials, as uh, Mr Rogers rightly points out, officials met with the oyster farmers affected and local representatives on Monday the 2nd of September and um, I'm told that was a very useful meeting and officials um, assured industry that, that um, I'm committed to assisting them where possible. Um, the position remains, I suppose, that there is no legislative provision to pay compensation for losses um, caused by fish disease and the fact that this wasn't an unusual event in that we have over the last number of years seen this happening, um, not just in Ireland, obviously, and in, in other areas also. It's been reported uh, mortalities in France and I think going back as far as 2009. So um, it isn't an unusual event, but that being said, it has obviously had a very negative impact on those people that have been um, affected by it. And I'm, I'm committed to um, working with the industry to see if we can uh, look at what are the research possibilities because obviously we have to tackle this disease we have to be able to find a way to um, help the industry because um, we don't want this to, to continue to be the situation this is something that can possibly happen to their crop year on year so we're going to work with um, Seafish the industry representative um, body and also the cross-border aquaculture initiative team because obviously this is something that's um, impacted in Carlingford Lock but also um, we have Lock Foyle and um, some of the bays then that will come under the jurisdiction of the 26 counties so I think that there are um, a number of key areas of work that we need to get involved with particularly around research and being able to tackle this disease. Sean Rogers. Thank you Minister. You did mention legislation that no legislation exists locally. Have you any plans to bring forward local legislation in order to provide much needed hardship package for these farmers? As I said, I'm very, very sympathetic to their plight and what's happened to them and the fact that they have had such major substantial losses. It's not just down to legislation, it's the fact that it's not an unusual event, I think, is the problem. That I think where, where, where I think I can assist most effectively these farmers is these uh, oyster farmers is that we look towards research, the science, the evidence, look at what, why this problem is occurring and try to get to a stage where obviously it's, it's not a major factor. Um, I'm aware of substantial losses of, of some of these people and it's a very distressing time. So I want to commit to them that we will work with them in terms of um, providing advice, support and also looking at how do we eradicate this disease, which is obviously a problem since 2009. Joanne Dobson. Mrs Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister give this House an update on the specific effort she is taking to ensure that the allocation key used to calculate the regional cap envelopes remains the same? so that Northern Ireland's allocation of the UK's envelope is not reduced? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had, um, over the last number of years, we've had the very hefty debate in Brussels and, and arguing for regional flexibility, which I'm very glad that we've been able to achieve. I think that um, whilst we've had all those high-level discussions and we have the broad framework, um, locally now the decisions have to be taken on how we best use the funds that are available to us um, and, and make sure we design a programme that's fit for purpose and fit for the local industry. In terms of um, us and our allocation and our share, I mean, obviously we have seen Scotland coming out arguing for additional funding. Unfortunately, we're starting off with a base where there's a reduced budget um, overall, but I certainly will be making sure, and I have been to date and will continue to do so, uh, engaging with DEFRA to make sure that we get our fair share, that we're not disadvantaged uh, and, and compared to, to other areas such as Scotland, Wales, and England, and I'll continue to do that. And that's a uh, discussion which actually is ongoing at this moment in time. Mrs. Dobson. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? And can the Minister inform us in a bit more detail than, than she given her answer what information she has received on this issue from the Deaf First Secretary and whether she has sought or indeed received an assurance from him that things will not change for us here in Northern Ireland? 
Well, we're in the middle of a negotiation. That will be ongoing until uh, we reach a final conclusion. Um, I have engaged with DEFRA um, myself, but also at official level, that's ongoing. As I said, I'll be fighting the corner for our local industry. I'll be fighting the corner to make sure that we get a fair allocation. As I said, I'm disappointed that we're starting off from a lower budget overall. But that being said, that is the case. But I'll continue to negotiate um, strongly. I expect that's going to intensify over the next few while. And I'm happy to inform the House whenever we have final settlement of the deal. But I'm not um, engaging uh, in the negotiation to come out with a poor deal for the six counties. Jonathan Craig. Mr Craig. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, could you outline what your department is doing to improve relations between the agri-food sector producers, i.e. the farmers, and the agri-food sector uh, retailers? Because there are big issues between the two. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. And um, I think if you um, cast your mind back over the last year to 18 months, we've had the debate around farm gate prices. We've had the campaign from the farming unions highlighting the, the actual prices that they have been paid. I think one of the, the areas that we obviously very strongly work together on is the whole agri-food strategy um, work that we're engaged with, both myself and Arling Foster, the Deputy Minister. We now have that strategy in place, or we now have that um, piece of work in place, and herself and myself are now working our way through it to see and present an action plan to the executive later in the year. But one of the key, um, uh, I suppose messages that has come out of that is that there needs to be fairness in the supply chain, that there needs to be um, that there are equal partners in the supply chain, that the farmer shouldn't be the person that's continually squeezed, that if we're going to be successful and continue to grow our agri-food industry, then we need to work with all sectors and we need to make sure that that whole supply chain is appreciated and valued in, 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 valued in equal measure. So for me, that's a key area of work in making sure that those um, two key players uh, work together. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, and I thank the minister for that answer. And in, in your answer, you actually pointed out a big issue there, how the profit margin is squeezed with the farmer. A lot of farmers fall into the small to medium enterprise category, in fact, some of them very small, and they really struggle with that very small profit level. So what, what can your department do to aid small farmers around that issue? Um, obviously, we have um, continual supports in place by way of single farm payments for, for the farmers, but also we look towards um, supports through the Rural Development Programme and I think that again we will have a new opportunity to look at um, new ways of working and new opportunities for farmers. We have had some very um, obviously excellent successes through the, the current Rural Development Programme in assisting farmers, particularly around diversification, around you know, food production, improving their premises, um, all, all of those um, positive um, areas of work and I will look forward to doing more of that in the new programme and I and am very keen to hear the views of stakeholders. Uh, including farmers, on how we shape the new rural development programme and what types of supports they would like to see in place, because obviously we want them to remain competitive and sustainable for the future. Barry Megalduff, Mr. Megalduff. Uh, uh, can I ask the minister what her department is doing to improve access to high-quality facilities in rural communities? And I ask this in light of some recent criticism, unjustified, I feel, at the way that RDP money is being spent. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that um, the criticism is unwarranted. I think that um, some of the, the projects that I have visited, particularly over the last couple of months, over the summer um, recess, I took the opportunity to get out and about and actually see for myself how the rural development programme has been um, spent in, in rural areas. And I have saw some very, very worthy projects. And we have to um, ensure that we support rural um, communities to be sustainable, to thrive. Uh, 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 for into the future, and that's very much for, for me the focus of the rural development program, particularly in Access Three and some of the projects that that we've been involved with. I mean, there's been a number of um, smaller projects on the ground, but also um, some of the bigger strategic projects. We really, really make a difference to the rural people's um, lives because quite often people are isolated just for geography, just for where they live. So they have no access to services. There's issues with transport. Um, the whole range of issues, the whole gambit of, of issues. So for me, the Rural Development Programme has been very successful in making sure that we are assisting rural communities to thrive, to be sustainable. And also, there's been a lot of positive measures around um, trying to encourage young people to stay in rural communities because, as um, the member will be very aware, we have so many young people now travelling abroad for work. And unless we um, are creative on the ground and actually working with communities, to address what they need, then um, I think we're failing those communities. So for me, the, these programmes are, are, are excellent and, and very um, worthy, and I look forward to the new rural development programme and making sure that we can do more of these in the future. Order members, that ends the period for topical questions.
We now move to those oral questions that appear uh, on the order paper uh, to the Minister of Agriculture. And I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one, please. Uh, in October um, 2012, my department and the Department of the Environment agreed a revised restoration plan with the Ulster Wildlife Trust and forwarded this to the European Commission. The plan reflects the recommendations contained in the 2011 Queen's University report for protection through the introduction of a large non-disturbance zone, intervention through the appointment of a postcode um, or of a post-doctoral research fellow, and the, the experimentation with translocation of horse mussels and the creation of artificial reefs, and finally the monitoring of horse mussels to indicate if recovery has taken place. The revised restoration plan has been with the Commission since October of last year. And although the Commission has yet to formally comment on the proposals, we understand informally that they and the Ulster Wildlife Trust are broadly content with it. In the meantime, both departments have pressed ahead with the establishment of the large non-disturbance zone identified in the plan. My department has prohibited sea fishing in the area, um, whilst the Department of the Environment has introduced bylaws to restrict anchoring, mooring and diving within it. Enforcement, enforcement has been strengthened with the deployment of a full-time fishery officer for Strangford Lock, and there has been a similar commitment from the Department of the Environment through the introduction of a Strangford Lock Ranger. All these are critical actions to deliver the protection required in the revised plan. Further, I understand that a postdoctorate research fellow has been appointed to undertake pilot studies on restoration prior to full-scale restoration in the medium to long term. And my department and AFB carried out the first ever survey of the seabed, which will result in a complete habitat map progress. Uh, towards uh, recovery, and then they'll be monitored. And before I call Anna Lowe, question number 10 has been withdrawn. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for a very comprehensive uh, answer, and, and I'm delighted there is now cooperation between the two departments. Can I ask the Minister, is she confident that all the, uh, the plan is going to go ahead and is going to be adequate in uh, addressing uh, the, 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 the restoration and that we won't face uh, fines, infraction fines? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that um, we have um, carried out some very positive partnership working with the Department of the Environment. And the fact that, as I said, we haven't had formal um, confirmation from Europe, but we're, um, it's been indicated that they're broadly content with the approach that we've taken. Um, I think the range of measures that we've set out um, are, are, um, are are dealing with the issue, but also we're looking at towards, because we want to create a sustainable fishery. We want to be able to um, have a sustainable fishery with the, um, and we also look towards the livelihood of those people who fish in the loch, because obviously there's a balance to be got on the environmental um, concerns and also those people that depend on the loch. So I feel like the measures that have been put forward um, adequately address that. And obviously we'll keep it under review and I'm um, happy to, to keep the member up to date as, as we do move forward that in our position as chair. Declan Magalier. Mr. Michael uh, Could the minister tell us are the um, muscle levels recovering? Um, oh, I suppose it's early days, but there are certainly indications that heart, horse muscles survive and clump when they're um, provided with sustainable or suitable habitat and that they're protected. So, as I said, there's no indication at this stage of a, of a significant increase in numbers, but it is um, uh, early days, because I, th I think that it will take a bit of time before we'll actually see um, some progress, given that mussels are a very uh, slow-growing and long-lived species. Mrs. Dobson. Speaker, progress at last now appears to have been made in this sorry tale, and we're no longer faced with the threat of another infraction fine. And my colleague in the European Parliament, Jim Nicholson, also received correspondence during the summer from Carl Falkenberg, Director General of Environment for the Commission in which he states that the file will be closed and understanding that the actions currently proposed will be implemented. Can the Minister now detail what lessons she has learned from this whole saga? Well, I can assure the member that um, I will take my, cons uh, my uh, role very seriously and I think that we have been very positively engaged with DOE, but there is always a balance to be got between the environmental concerns and people's livelihood. because. Um, there would be some people that would advocate that you should just stop um, fishing completely. And then where would that leave those people that really depend on the lock? So I think that what we have here is a very balanced approach. We're very much um, aware of the environmental concerns. We are um, now very much engaged with the Ulster Wildlife Trust, and they're content with 
uh, the approach that we have taken. So I think in the round, it's been a very positive um, engagement. The Ulster Wildlife Trust had an issue. They raised it. We addressed it. It's as simple as that. Dominic Bradley. Mr Bradley. I got the John Collier cash over the Question number two, please. Uh, I believe that a joint approach by both government and the agri-food industry provides the most effective approach to ensuring that another fodder crisis is averted in the winter, um, in common winter. To this end, I've established the fodder task force, bringing together representatives and stakeholders in the agri-food industry, along with DAR, to consider the issues facing the livestock industry in the ensuing year and to produce an action plan to mitigate the effects of any potential problems. To date, the task force has met on four occasions, and in July, it agreed the action plan which is available on the DARD website. I plan to meet the task force representatives in the near future for an update, and although they don't intend to meet as a group again until midwinter, they will get together in the interim if a situation develops and new actions are required. There is much that farmers can do to plan for the winter ahead, and DARD has been very active in providing advice and support to ensure that they are well prepared. CAFRI has embarked on a comprehensive programme of workshops, advisory events and publications, helping farmers to maximise fodder production, to stock take their individual fodder supply and to manage their stock to make most efficient use of the available fodder. The task force also brought together representatives of um, auxiliary agri-food industries with a focus on both the practical and emotional difficulties faced by the farming community. Feed suppliers, banks and food processors recognise that it is in the interests of the whole agri-food industry to work together to help farmers through the challenging winter months. Dominic Bradley. Is it all right for me to continue, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, and uh, the question I have for the Minister is with re regard to uh, those who transport uh, fodder. My understanding is that some of them have not yet been paid. And could I ask the Minister uh, when they could hope to receive their payment? I'll, I'll, I'll not get into individual situations, but um, the majority of, of um, the transporters have been paid. There may be a few outstanding issues which the Department are working with, but I'm very assured that it's, it, it's a very minute number. But if the member wants to pick up a, outside of the question time a particular um, company, I'm happy for him to call into private office. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, you, you have outlined the steps that your department has taken to prepare farmers for the future. Can you outline what steps your department has taken and is currently taking to support the mental well-being of the farmers and their families who were affected during this crisis and to make sure that there is support there on an ongoing basis? I, I absolutely agree with you. And given the difficult year that we've had in the farming industry with um, even the prolonged uh, winter last year, the snow, horse meat, um, all the issues that have been coming thick and fast at, at the industry uh, and I suppose just the general economic um, climate. It's been a very difficult time for farmers so um, I was delighted then that the task force actually took that on board and also invited in people like Rural Connect, the people like Rural Support Network who provide obviously fantastic services um, to the rural community and that, that has continued and we've also continued to work through CAFRI um, with uh, Rural Support and making sure that we're um, taken forward a number of uh, workshops for CAFRI advisors so that they're well equipped to deal with people because, as you said, mental well-being, and it's something that we all should be concerned about, everybody's mental well-being, um, is, is a key concern and it has to be a factor throughout any of these situations that obviously cause um, financial stress or general stress to, to, to anybody. Ian Millen. Well, good, uh, Ken Collier. I would like to ask the Minister uh, what is the current assessment of fodder stocks? Well, um, obviously we've had um, a good summer, we've had, um, particularly the start of the summer, and the good weather has um, assisted the, the growth recovery. Um, the final yield obviously won't be known until um, such times as I suppose we have the final, um, the end of the growing season, which is um, upcoming. But I think it's fair to say that grass utilisation has been better than last year. Um, I think we're in, a, in a, I suppose, a more of a positive situation. But as I say, the task force um, is, is happy to come back together and keep the situation under review if we felt that 
um, come the end of the growing season that there were going to be particular issues. So um, at this stage, as I said, the weather has been kind to us, but um, I suppose it, de it depends how, how we end up at the end of the growing season. Roy Banks. Mr Banks. Question number three. <clears throat> Responsibility for tackling rural crime rests primarily with the PSNI and the Department of Justice. Theft of any kind has an emotional and financial impact on the lives and fortunes of rural communities. And I'm very aware of the, wor of the worry that the level of rural crime causes amongst the farming community. I have met with the Chief Constable and Minister Ford on a number of occasions to make him aware of my concerns. One of the actions that emanated from the Rural Wide Paper Action Plan, which I launched in June 2012, was the establishment of a rural crime unit by the Department of Justice. That unit was launched in May of this year and will use all available data sources to help identify trends and patterns um, that will assist with preventative action, help to improve community confidence and ultimately reduce uh, rural crime. Helping to build safer rural communities is also important for my department. My department's local CAFRI advisors are supporting the PSNA and the farm farming organisations in raising awareness of measures that farmers can take to reduce incidents of crime on their farms. In particular, they're briefing farmers on local initiatives and distributing information. CAFRI, through its participation in the Farm Watch scheme at its Inniskill and Lockery and Greenmount campuses, is encouraging local farmers to use this scheme as an important means to prevent rural crime. And the scheme is designed to help um, reduce rural crime and uses technological tools to provide vital evidence in criminal investigations. So I'm going to continue to work closely with all the relevant stakeholders to ensure that the specific needs of rural dwellers are taken into account when we're developing community safety initiatives. Roy Banks. Stolen metal items can range from lead on roofs to redundant equipment to tractors and machinery costing five and six figure sums. So has the Minister and her officials attempted to quantify what is that cost in terms of repairs and replacement, in terms of disruption to business? and indeed any additional cost on insurance premiums, because that is a, of a major cost to the industry in Northern Ireland. Has her department attempted to quantify that cost? It's not an area of work that we have been involved with. I think um, in terms of my role, I've been very vocal in making sure that we've raised the issues with DOJ, Department of Justice and the PSNA. And I do welcome the fact that we now have um, the, the unit in place. I, you know, the responsibility for gathering statistics around um, uh, rural crime rests solely with um, PSNA. But I think, I mean, in, in looking at some of the statistics that PSNA have, have um, produced, I welcome the fact that we would have a slight reduction, particularly uh, in terms of, um, obviously there's a difference between rural crime and agri-crime, which the member will be, will be aware of. And the statistics that PSNA have produced would show a fall in, in rural crime and agri-crime of 11.2% and then 1.9% uh, respectively compared to last year. Whilst that's positive, it's still it's, it's not enough. We still want to tr um, do everything that we can to try and eradicate it. And whilst those statistics are positive, I mean, I'm aware of particular areas where, particularly in the Clahar Valley area, for example, where there'd be particular um, areas with cattle theft, particular problems with cattle theft. So we need to um, keep our finger on the pulse. We need to continue to work together. And I'm um, always willing to play my role and work with PSNA and the Department of Justice when it comes to tackling rural crime and raising the profile of rural crime so that um, it's continually on, on their agenda. George Robinson. Mr. Robinson. Mr. I directed my officials to carry out a business case um, addressing only the options for new headquarters for my department at Ballykelly. Um, the work to identify uh, cost analysis and options to accommodate our headquarters on the Ballykelly site is complete and was informed by input from the accommodations, accommodation options study produced by Central Procurement Directorate, the quality impact assessment and the staff surveys. So I expect the process to be um, completed by the end of October. Thank the Minister for her answer. Is the Minister confident any outstanding uh, tra staff transfer issues will be resolved? Apologies, I didn't. Oh. Maybe ask the member to repeat the supplementary. I want to ask the minister: Will uh, is the minister confident any staff transfer issues will be resolved? Absolutely. I mean, um, I've said from the start of this process that I was committed to making sure that nobody would be forced to move, and obviously, key um, to the move are staff and staff being satisfied. Um, anybody that has a current contract of employment with the department, obviously, that has to be honoured. So, um, throughout the whole process, we've made sure that we've talked to staff 
side representatives, um, talked to the trade unions, made sure that um, they were fully involved in, in the process. I've now had um, been engaged with um, three staff surveys, um, Dundonald House staff, so headquarters staff, then the wider um, Department of Agriculture staff, and then also the wider civil service. So I'm content that, um, given the numbers of staff that have indicated that they would want to move to um, the North West, um, we would be in, in a great position to be able to move forward as, according to the plan that I've um, set out. Jill Byrne. The Minister for Answers thus far. Can the Minister confirm or otherwise if the business mm -hmm. case is focusing on a new build of an office for 600 employees and what does that do for a comparative analysis with locations? The business case actually, um, whilst I directed the Permanent Secretary to take forward the business case looking at one site, we did look at uh, a range of options. Um, I'll not get into the detail of, of the options, but there were nonetheless um, three or four uh, possible um, area ways to, to take the project forward. Um, the business case examined all of those, but um, the committee will obviously be furnished with that uh, in due course. Gary McCarthy, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the minister's um, guarantee for the. Uh, staff that's already there in Dundonald House, but will, if there are some members that wish to um, avail of the transfer to Ballykelly, will there be any uh, mileage uh, allowance given to those staff uh, to assist them on that uh, journey? Um, again, they'll all be issues. Um, DFP through um, Human Resources, obviously, they, they will manage the, the movement of staff right across the civil service. Um, and that will all be worked out and all be factored into the business case that, that will go forward. So, um, obviously, all, all those issues will, be, will have to be considered. We want to make sure that staff um, come forward. Uh, and I, I'm quite enthused by the number of staff, actually, who live in the northwest area that are very keen to get a place of employment, which is closer to home, instead of making the travel every day, obviously, into the greater Belfast area. So, I think it's all manageable. And, and as I said, I'm committed to working with staff to make sure that we look at their personal circumstances and, and make sure that everybody is comfortable with the move. Sean Lynch. Can call you on Golden Great Castellanara and I thank the Minister for her answer. Could I ask the Minister how she engaged with staff to address any uh, concerns they may have? Yeah, as, as I said, um, we have engaged with staff throughout the whole process, and to me that's key to the success of the, pro of the process, making sure that people are content. One of the key issues that uh, we did. Uh, in, in, in talking to staff was uh, the three-stage survey, which um, I outlined earlier, where initially um, we talked to DARD uh, headquarters staff in Donald House, and then secondly, um, the rest of the DARD staff, up to just over 3,000 staff, and then the rest of the civil service. So I'm quite um, pleased by the results that, um, whilst there'll be some, a majority of number, I suppose, of people who work in Donald House were um, maybe less keen to move, because DARD has been there for and 50 years, and probably the, the majority of the workforce is made up with people who, who live local to it. But there are um, quite a number of people, um, way over the number of people that would be needed even for um, the new headquarters, that are very keen to want to move uh, to the North West. So um, I want to continue to engage with staff because, as I said, they are key uh, in terms of a successful move. McQuillan. Question five. In July this year, I, launched, I jointly launched the All Ireland Clara Control Strategy with Minister Tom Hayes in Dublin. The strategy provides a framework for the implementation of our policy of identification, control, and eradication of the casual agents of Clara Ash Dieback in Ireland and sets out the actions that will be taken to implement it. One of these actions was to provide grant support for woodland owners of recently planted ash trees affected by Clara Ash Dieback to replant their woodland and alternative tree species. Grant support is made within the scope of the existing rural development programme forestry grant uh, scheme operated by Forest Service and it's paid at 50% of the approved costs to support eligible operations. To build further resilience in woodland in response to the growing risk of tree disease, the scheme will require planting, replanting to result in at least three species to form significant components of the woodland. So I'm particularly pleased that some suppliers of affected plants have acknowledged um, their commitment to their clients by reinstating affected plantations at their own expense. To reduce the risk of the disease becoming established in our mature ash woodland and hedgerows, my department will continue to require owners of, to destroy affected ash trees and associated debris. Forest Service will offer help to private woodland owners participating in a forestry grant scheme to carry out that work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Sure, the Minister would agree with me that this is a very worrying time for landowners of that type, and any help and reinsurance that the Minister can give will certainly help ease the pressure. 
Absolutely, um, I totally agree with you, and, and um, I think we can be in some ways comforted by the fact that we haven't found the infection in the wider environment at this stage, so uh, in some, some senses that at this moment in time is a, is a positive. But yes, absolutely, um, that was why I brought forward the, the grant support to actually assist people to be able to restock because people are, are obviously concerned about what it means for them for the future if they were obviously dependent on the income from harvesting the wood. Chris Hazard. Can I ask the Minister to outline what engagement her department have had with industry stakeholders in relation to ice dieback thus far? Yeah, um, my officials have regular meetings and, and contact with um, stakeholders who are affected as a result of um, I suppose any um, plant health issues. And these meetings include updates on pest and disease recognition to help both professionals and other stakeholders to report suspected cases. Um, my department has established a group of stakeholders which has met um, on four occasions to date to give advice and then in conjunction with um, officials develop policy recommendations in response to the Clara Ash dieback. In addition to information that is available from um, a dedicated plant and three health link on the DARD website, a plant health helpline number and an email address are in place to deal with specific inquiries. And stakeholders are aware that the department has uh, a fast map system within its G, uh, GIS technology in place to advise the up-to-date position on the disease. Danny Kenahan, Mr Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I may I thank the Minister for our answer. I didn't fully understand it clearly where landowners will stand in line with grants that they either were to get or are yet to get in relation to trees that have had to be uprooted and whether they'll get further grants when they plant again because they will still have more costs um, in putting them in. I suppose just, just to clarify then, we have actually only had three applications so far that have come forward um, for, for the grant. Um, one grant obviously per project, but if you have more than one project then you can come forward for, for each project. So um, if you have one plant, if you maybe have numerous plantings, um, you can come forward. But I will get the member the, all the details of that, but we to date only have actually three people who have come forward um, for thing. But I can certainly provide the member with more details on the actual scheme itself. Sandra O'Brien. Mrs. O'Brien. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. The starting point for CAP reform was the Commission's original proposals, which were widely regarded as being complex. In negotiations to date, I have um, achieved a lot in terms of simplifying the Commission's original proposals, particularly in relation to greening and the mechanism to move um, to a flat rate. Uh, on greening, the exemption of predominantly grassland farms with small arable areas from crop diversification and ecological focus area requirements has been an important achievement. I also achieved flexibility to allow us to monitor permanent grassland at a regional level um, as opposed to an individual farm level. And these are um, obviously very positive developments um, for what, uh, our industry, which is predominantly grass-based um, agriculture. However, it has to be acknowledged that the political agreement reached between member states and representatives of the main political groups of the European Parliament in June of this year will introduce a more complex direct payment system um, than the current regime. For example, we'll be moving from a single payment regime to a minimum of three separate payments with obviously options for more. And the agreement will also place additional obligations on some farmers, particularly around greening. The agreement provides a very considerable degree of regional flexibility, which will enable me to better meet the needs, the local needs um, when taking the key decisions. The need for simplification will certainly influence this decision uh, making process, and I intend to consult um, on my proposals for CAP uh, reform over the next month. And I look forward to constructive um, stakeholder engagement throughout that process. Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. What engagement has, your has the Minister's Department had or is planning to have with member states or regions who have a track record for impl implementing a sim simplified cap uh, that is workable on the ground at farmer level and is cost achievable to the Administrator? Well, obviously, we'll always look towards good practice. If there's a better way to do something that we do, then we, we, will, we will look to it and, and learn from it and improve what, what, what we do. I think we have a great opportunity now to shape this program to make sure it does suit the local needs. Um, and that's why I, I look forward to, to the actual um, engagement process, the consultation process, that which we're going to take forward over the autumn winter. I think, in some senses, um, whilst we, we agreed the framework in Europe, it nearly was the easy part. It's going to be now when we're taking the local decisions and obviously the competing um, interests from different sectors within the agri-food industry. So um, that's where it's going to be difficult. But um, I think that if we're um, very open to engagement, we all have the same ambition 
in wanting to um, have a sustainable agricultural system and making sure that we want to uh, continue to grow in terms of the agri-food strategy uh, uh, recommendations, grow the agri-food industry then. Um, we have a great um, opportunity in front of us now to be able to shape this new rural development programme to suit the needs of our industry um, in the period ahead up into 2020. Jonathan Craig. Mr Craig. Question number seven, Mr Speaker. Uh, at this year's Balmoral Show, I announced that Rivers Agency headquarters would relocate to the Lockery College site in Cookstown. At the same time, I announced that Fisheries Division would relocate to South Down, and I had previously announced that Forest Service would relocate to Fermanagh and the rest of the departmental headquarters then to Balakele. I have now agreed with my official that these four relocations should be taken forward as separate projects um, under the governance of the HQ Relocation Programme Board. Each of the four projects will have their own specific project plan and time frame. However, there are many synergies between the projects, particularly in areas such as HR, finance and ICT and project management structures. So it's appropriate that such resources and knowledge are shared across the four projects where possible. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, what uh, level of consultation will take place with regard to the employees there? And uh, will the Minister also take into account the views of a lot of those employees who do not wish to move uh, anywhere else around this? And could you maybe outline to the House what the rationale behind the movement of the Rivers Agency is, as this is a relatively new facility that they have? No, Rivers Agency um, were, were due for, for moving, actually. Their, their headquarters aren't in great um, condition. Whenever we looked at um, a site for Rivers Agency to move to, well, I'll, I'll start at the start, actually. Um, for me, this is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. For me, this is the principal point of what we're trying to achieve. With fisheries going into um, South Down, or into County Down, with um, uh, Rivers Agency going into Lockery, with Forestry going into Fermanagh, that's a fair distribution which we haven't seen to date in public sector jobs. So for me, that's, that's a major win. There's all the associated benefits that will come from those wins, the, any construction costs, ongoing maintenance, and footfall into those areas. So for me, that's, that's a major win for this executive that we're leading the way uh, in terms of delivering public sector jobs on a fair um, basis. But in terms of the, the move itself, as I said from the start when I talked about the headquarters move, I'm very keen to engage with staff. I have done so in terms of the Rivers Agency move. And the Lockery site itself is a great site, particularly in the fact that Rivers Agency is an emergency responder who need to get out quickly onto the main network. Cookstown is in, a, is in a, a, a prime location to allow it to be able to do that. So it's got a great central location. It's got access to the roads network. And also we have the Lockery site um, within Dard's um, own portfolio. So for me, um, it, it's an excellent site for it. And I'm um, always going to engage with staff as we move forward. Ross Hussey. Mr. Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Can the Minister detail how many jobs are actually involved in the relocation of the Rivers Agency headquarters? And will the number in Cookstown be the same as those currently employed in Belfast, or will there be a divergence? It would be intended that, um, that all of Rivers Agency in the main, apart from those that are based out in, in local offices, will be moving. Um, so the headquarters staff will move to, to Cookstown. I don't have the exact figure, but I think it's 50, 50 plus 50 um, odd uh, numbers of staff um, that, will, that will move. And as I said from the start, I want to make sure that staff are happy with the move, that um, all staff are content, that their own circumstances are taken into account. And that's all part of the process. It's all inherent in the process that um, I'm taking forward for the, all the moves. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number eight, please. My department has a robust EU Commission approved TB eradication programme in place that is based on testing to detect infected cattle, removing infected animals, and reducing the risk of disease spread through movement controls and other biosecurity measures. The same disease control measures are applied to both beef and dairy herds. This rigorous TB eradication programme will continue to be a priority to ensure the continued access to the export trade by our livestock and our livestock products industry, which is worth over a thousand million per year. I'm pleased to report that the rise in TB herd incidents, uh, which we witnessed last year, which peaked in October um, to 7.46%, has since reduced to 6.63% at the end of July. Uh, so far this year, there's been a 24% reduction in the number of animals removed as TB reactors and a 15% reduction in the number of new herd breakdowns when compared to the same period last year. However, I'm not complacent with that. Um, the aim is obviously to achieve a sustained and progressive reduction towards the ultimate eradication of TB here. 
Work was ongoing to reassess the current programme and identify any additional actions which would enhance our current approach to TB. In the coming weeks, when this work is concluded, I will announce any proposed additional measures to further strengthen our robust programme. In addition to our EU-approved programme, I will continue to invest in TB research and learn from the outcome research undertaken by other administrations to enable us to refine our approach to TB in light of new scientific developments. Order, members, that concludes questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. We now move.